know what? It, it, it starts in, in very subtle ways, too. Like, I'm a big believer in you don't you don't use the nail gun until you know how to use a hammer really well. You know, you got to... Couldn't agree more. You got to you gotta learn to crawl before you walk, and walk before you run kind of thing, you know? Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Justin Fink. I'll be your host. I am joined by Brian Pontalillo, our design editor. Hey, Justin. How's it going? And before we get going, just a quick reminder of all the ways that you can stay connected to us. You can send us questions about your projects, ideas for discussion, or suggestions for future guests by sending an email to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. We have show notes for this and every episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. And you can also watch videos of each episode at the same web address as well as a Fine Home Building channel on YouTube. Or if you're in the area of Newtown, Connecticut, you can always pop in uh, for, uh, here at, at Taunton from around, you know, have a have a bagel and some coffee with Brian, usually around 9 a.m. or so on a weekdays. As soon as I get so, to work. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> of joining us, Jeff, can we get a little drum roll here because today... On the phone, we have none other than Brent Hull. Brent is a graduate of the North Bennett Street School's Historic Preservation Program, the founder and owner of Hull Historical in Texas, where he focuses on preservation as well as historically inspired houses and millwork, and has most recently gained a lot of nationwide recognition for his show on the History Channel, a little program he likes to call Lone Star Restoration. How are you today, Mr. Hull? Good. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Pretty good. Was that a good intro? Did I hit everything? You've done. You do a million different things. Um, that was a good start. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of starts, let's. Um, um, we wanted to to go way back to the beginning, if you're willing. I want to hear a little bit about uh, how you got started at North Bennett Street School. So, uh, North Bennett Street was an excellent experience for me. I recommend it to anybody out there. It. Uh, you know, they they call it an education in craftsmanship. It's got violin making, uh, book binding. Harvard and Yale actually gone to North Bennett Street and said, we're having to send our books back to Europe. Can you start a book binding program? And so it's that type of school, right? It had, it's a school where they care about craft. They care about, you know, quality. And so I went there. I'd grown up. Uh, doing construction, being handy, liking working mm. on cars and things like that. And uh, so the idea when I found out about North Bend Street was pretty awesome. I mean, I, I was saying at the time I didn't want to be a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. Yeah. And the idea of, of gaining uh, and learning a craft at that time um, was pretty cool. I mean, they, they said, look, if you're here for two years, this is your apprenticeship. Uh, you get out, you're a journeyman, and then you work towards being a master. And so it's pretty old school, and it was an uh, excellent experience. That's su- And by the way, that program is still going on, right? I mean, you can still be a, a historic restoration yep. student. Yeah, in fact, I took my son up there, uh, who's just graduated from college, and uh, showed him the school this summer. I'm not sure he's ready yet, but uh, God willing, if he's going to go into the business, it'd be definitely a place he needs to go learn. Um they still have the preservation program. The school's doing well. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a great place. And all right, so you did. The, are you from out east originally, Brent? I know you're in. I know you're out. No, here. I grew up. I was born in Colorado, and then my parents moved to Texas, uh, and so I grew up in Dallas. Oh, okay. And I've now been in Fort Worth for almost 25 years. So was was that time at uh, North Bennett Street School your only time up in the Northeast? I mean, in college, I had a roommate, then I went up there and hung out in Block Island and Vermont yeah. one summer. Um, but no, yeah, I didn't spend much time up there. Well, that, that, that's kind of interesting to me because I think for, as, as, as you know, New Englanders, I think we tend to think of historic homes as, we, th- we think we have ownership of historic homes in the United States. Right. And we, think, <laughs> we think as soon as you leave New England, everything's new. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, well, I mean. It, it goes without saying that this this end of the country was was settled first, and then we kind of moved west. Yeah. But you're you're right. I don't. When I think of Texas, I don't think historic houses. Yeah. But then you. you yeah, know, I mean, there's there's no doubt. When I left North Bend Street, I had to change my uh, time setting, if you want to put it that way. I mean, it, instead of working on buildings from the 1800s, we were working on buildings from the 1900s. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the majority of the housing stock in Texas. 
uh, which was really, you know, settled pretty late. I mean, you have the, the you know, the Alamones and those other buildings which stayed to the, uh, you know, early 16 and 1700s. But, but for the most part, the housing stock is, you know, 1920s, 1900s. Uh, we do a lot of courthouse restoration work in those buildings, some of the oldest, nicest buildings, and they're 1880s. Mm-hmm. So I had to change my perspective of, of what I was looking at. Instead of building Georgian and federal things, we was doing, you know, Victorian and arts and crafts. So uh, it was nice, though. I mean, it was it was nice changing your perspective and, and kind of learning how things built. I, I, the great thing for me in North Bennett Street was we were working on, you know, an, an old barn or an old building from the 1800s and learning how to build the way they built 200 years ago. And then so I'd drive home and drive by a new development, and the, the contrast between how we built 200 years ago versus how we build today is just night and day. Everything's changed. The architecture and design has changed. The materials have changed. Uh, the crafts and carpentry have changed. The tools have changed. And so that perspective of seeing how, th- how America was built you know, 200 years ago and then through the centuries, I think is really the thing that's grounded me and grounded my education and has been the basis for how I approach building today. So for people that don't understand... I mean, Brian and I would consider ourselves remodelers, but right. But can you kind of put into words what exactly is a restoration carpenter? You know, because I don't think it's what people think it is. I mean, it's not that you're necessarily an expert in fixing up old houses. It's it's sort of a different level than that, right? Yeah, it's so. There's some. I would call it preservation speak. Uh, there are some there are some rules for how you approach things uh, when you're doing preservation. There's there's ideas that you want anything you do to a, a, an old house to be reversible, so that you, someone can come along later and and take it away. Uh, for instance, you if you have a a brick, you wouldn't paint the brick because that's that's not really a reversible thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. What you're trying to do is you're trying to capture the story of a historic building. And when you change that narrative, when you change that, you know, th- that look and feel. For instance, if you take a bungalow, 1900s bungalow, and you put a brand new kitchen in it, okay, mm-hmm. you you go from something that had, you know, a kitchen in the 1900s would have been a servant's area, would have been very undecorated and uh, very simple uh, paint gray cabinets, and then you put these new stain gray cabinets and, and fancy trim. You've changed that narrative, and so as a preservation carpenter, you then look at it and go, okay, how are we going to blend this story? How are we going to build a uh, new kitchen that functions and works the way it should, but looks historic? And so it's a little bit of a a different mindset of the way you approach things and the way you build things. Um, And that's, that's, you know, 80 or 90 percent of what we do. The other part is that we actually are still doing, you know, historic restoration where we have to make things exactly the way they would, the way they would have been 100 years ago. And so we do a little bit of both. And when I'm you, not sure I answered your question. No, but, you did. But it, in fact, I have many more off of what you just said. When you say that you have to make it the way they did, does that include the actual techniques of building it? Like you, you're actually breaking out the hand tools and you're doing it the way they would have done it? Or is it... Um, just that the end result has to be convincing. So uh, realize that you know, the, the industrialization of woodworking happens in 1870 after the Civil War. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at um, the, the books and catalogs, even the woodworking equipment from 1880, 1890, they had every tool we have in our shop today. They had wide belt standers, table saws, shapers, dupla carvers, didn't have a CNC, I don't suspect, but they had about <laughs> everything else. So uh, when I talk about when we're in Texas and we have an 1880s uh, building, we're matching wood. Okay, so we're going back with historic wood. We're matching profiles. We're, our joinery is the same, so the exposed joinery and a, and a double-hung window. Um, and the hardware and the, and the matching pieces like that are the same. The glass sometimes is restoration glass. But uh, we're, we're not having to use hand tools because we're in the post-industrial era and they didn't really 
finish things with hand planes at that time. If they were, if we work on something from the 1820s, um, yes, we have to do that. But we don't. Our our focus and our work is really post-industrial, not earlier stuff. And and is that like kind of a, a, a self-imposed? Do you think, or do you think customers expect when they say, "Hey, Brian, we want you to come work on this courthouse, and we want you to fix up, you know, this window or whatever you're going to be working on, restore it back to its original charm"? Um, do they expect you your process to be matching the the original process or do they is it is that sort of like just you applying this kind of romantic bent to it so it's a little bit of both i mean there there is education of our clients at every level from the homeowner to the architect to the contractor when we're a subcontractor for some of these guys um there's education that has to take place explaining this deal and so what we'll do is we'll say look you can have this thing done three different ways, okay? We can come back and do it, you know, as a pure historic preservation, the way I was trained in North Bennett Street, where we hand plane wood or do whatever exactly, um, or we can do it close, or we can just kind of give a, you know, nudge to that way but not really be there. And so mm. usually once you explain it that way, the cost between, you know, doing pure preservation and then just, close restoration is pretty far the the gap between you know doing it in the middle ground to to just kind of a nudge is pretty close so they usually end up picking if budget is tight just kind of that middle ground we'll have 10 percent of our clients who'll say no 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 i want it made exactly the way it was made i want everything that way i want to i want to take hardware and get it recast Mm -hmm. so that it matches exactly right but then you probably also have the people who are like, you know, I don't mind if you drive a screw through behind where I can't see it. As long, if it's, exactly. Yeah, okay, I yeah. see. So that, that, that demands a, an amazing amount of research to figure out how these things were all put together. How, where do you even start with something like that? I mean, how do people uh, – like I live in a, a 1925 Sears kit house. Right. So the extent of my research is like looking back at the Sears catalog – and right. seeing what the original floor plans and pictures and molding profiles and things were. And I have the blueprints for it, but but what I don't have is like a wider understanding of of like what was appropriate or why they did X, Y, or Z. Um, how do you how do people get that knowledge? Or is it just Well, that's a good question. The and the, and if you could see where I'm standing right now, I'm standing in my library. I've got almost three thousand books here. Um, I've seen I pictures love of that I've research. I was a history yeah. and English major in college. And so I, I just love that. And so I have uh, 10 or 20 catalogs of kit homes. There was Aladdin. There was a number of other uh, kit home companies in that time and how they were built. There is um, what's called, the, the, I'm looking at it right now, the, the Radford Company put out the Cyclopedia of Building, and which, which shows how things were built in the 1920s. And so there's actually, I, I collected most of this library through eBay and then through uh, a book dealer up in, uh, up in Massachusetts, a guy named Steve Schuler. Mm-hmm. He has uh, so much, his catalog, his company specializes in building trade. And so you have to go do the, do the research. I mean, there's no doubt, it, but it exists and it's out there. There's also an incredible resource um, through the APT um, called the Building Technology Library. And basically, it's, I think they've got eight or 10,000 volumes of uh, catalogs online right now. It's a free resource. I think I was reading an article about it. They have 50,000 visitors a month to this, to this, ca- to this site. It's incredible. They, they, you, you type in p- painting, and they'll pull up all the painting catalogs that they have, and you can look at them by year to figure out, you know, what the colors were, what the popular colors were at that time. And what is it, so the, the APT? The is research that- is available. It's out there, and it's, uh, it's fascinating. So that's, that's the, the main place where you do the research. Um, but, look, I, I'm a geek. I love this stuff. And so when I moved back to Fort, Fort Worth from Boston, I started buying books about Frank Lloyd Wright, Green and Green, Gustav Stickley, because I had to change my perspective on what I was looking at. I had to change that time period. I was no longer looking at Georgian and federal houses, but arts and crafts. So what is the arts and crafts? 
What is that all about? What is the understanding? What's that late Victorian period like? And so how things were built. So I just, I just collect all these books and just read about it just because I love it. So the quick answer is the information's out there, but it does take research to figure it out. And what was the, the website, the APT? Is that the yeah, people hang on, don't know? Um, it's, I think I've got it right here. Hang on. I assume it's um, Preservation Trust or... Yeah, yeah it's, so it's the... Uh, there was a great article written about it um, in uh, Traditional Building Magazine. Gordon Bach did it uh, in February of 2017. So it's the... Uh, Building Technology Heritage Library. It's put out by the APT. Um, it looks like it's www.archive.org. That's a good name. Or you can go to apti.org and you can look for their uh, the Heritage Library. Building Technology Heritage Library. Beautiful. That's I had no idea that existed. Hey, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. Brent, I'm really curious um, with your background and in, in, in all this knowledge and and understanding now of homes i'm really curious when you look at new houses and i'm sure you'd have a, a whole lot to say about um about style uh, when it comes to new houses but i'm curious about construction and um building methodologies and if, if there are things that you think we're we're really missing the boat on by not continuing to do in traditional ways well um how long do we have this? <laughs> oh man, I, I want you to just go. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're I think we're in a really dangerous time period as far as craftsmanship, craft, building quality. I think that uh, manufacturers have begun to make their products so they can be installed by a homeowner, mm-hmm. and they bypass a lot of traditional ways of building things that are actually better. Uh, you think about the tiles that snap in place, or you think about the wood floors that snap together. These kind of things that are, that are snapped together doesn't improve us. doesn't 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 make anything better. Yeah. I, I, was, I wrote a book called "Building the Timeless House in an Instant Age," and it has it basically takes the the, the areas of architecture, materials, craftsmanship, and kind of what's changed over time, and why kind of we build ugly houses today. Mm-hmm. Um, I think <laughs> I'm trying to be diplomatic here. Yeah, um, you don't have to. I be think diplomatic. we're building crappy houses. I think we're building disposable houses. I think yeah. that people are chasing the the Walmart price thing so much that we end up with stuff that just won't last. Yeah. Um, the example I give in my talks is I say, you know, look, they're, they they these manufacturers invent plastic wood because wood's rotting. And in my experience, if we just figured out how to pitch a window sill so that it didn't hold water, we wouldn't have to do that. Right. Um, it's like we've forgotten how to build. Right. And so then you end up with things where there is a such a, a misunderstanding of, of how things work. A keystone is a perfect example that goes over a window. How a keystone was originally supposed to work to support the brick above it. Uh, what a gauged brick arch is right over a window so that it's self-supporting. Now you end up with all these, in Texas, we, we're a very strong brick market. And so, but those but those uh, details and the, the elements and the pieces are almost like stickers they put on the house. It's like, well, we need it to look traditional. Let's put a column here. And the column is just this toothpick, right? It's, it's just, it's ugly. It doesn't work. And if you look at, you know, this kind of pre-1940 versus post-1940, why is that this, the, you know, this timeline of, of, where, of where quality changes? Well, you have the rise of production builders in the, in the early 50s and into the 60s. Mm-hmm. I believe that they taught a generation of builders how to build cheap and fast. Right. You know, William Levitt, I write a lot about him in my book. I, in many respects, I think he was a genius. He was a guy that le- built Levittown in the, in the late 40s and 50s after the war, um, built a huge production uh, building empire, right? Uh, but it was all about building quick, cheap, and fast. Uh, without, you know, the architect was pushed out of it, so the designer was gone from the process, and it was all about building quick. Now, there was nothing wrong with Levittown at that time, but you fast forward 30 years, and the reason... We have a, the term McMansion today 
is because house is all, you know, they're cookie cutter. They're, they're all, you know, built the same. There's a lot of things. <laughs> you guys got me going. I like um, it. I like it. There's a lot of things that, that, are, that are similar culturally about what's going on, okay? People used to get sick. Uh, people got sick of drinking Folgers coffee when they discovered what really good coffee is. We had, we had produced or driven the cost down of coffee so much that we were drinking crappy beans, right? All of a sudden, some guys come along and they get passionate about coffee, and now we have good cups of coffee. I would think the same thing is true with you talk about fast food versus slow food. Mm-hmm. You talk about it, the same things happening in the fashion industry where they're talking about how cheap products are and how couture used to be this incredibly well-made product. And now it's just an expensive kind of brand. And so the same thing's happening in a building, guys. We People want quality. They want craft. But they're chasing after price. They're chasing after the wrong thing. And we end up with crappy, ugly houses. And and something you said in there, first of all, I agree with everything you're saying. But there's something that you said in there that, that we've talked about here on the show before. We've talked about Mary Ann Cusato and her book, um, sure. Get, Get Your House Right, which I... Great I, book. I, yeah. Um, And some of the points that she makes in there are overlapping with the points you make is when you forget what the origins of the architectural elements are, you forget, you don't know how to use them. So you talk about, you talk about the keystone and it becomes a decorative element over a window. But if you don't understand that it used to be there for a structural purpose, Mm -hmm. you don't know how to size it right. You don't know what material it should be. and, And that's when everything starts to get watered down and, and people stop caring about it. Um, but you know, I often wonder if if I mean there will be people there will will be people who say, well, who cares? You know, why if I'm installing baseboard right now, and traditionally it was installed to cover the uh, the board that I would you know what, what do they call that when you're when you're leveling board when you're screening off the plaster? I guess they call that a baseboard, don't they? Um, and then you would put on the cap and it would become decorative. Well, if we don't do plaster anymore, Brent, then why do I need that? Why do I need my piece of molding to be that way? And I guess you can make the argument it doesn't anymore, but I, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, if you but if you go back to the origins of the base mold that that, that goes beyond just when they were putting plaster as a screed board on the wall, there, the, it goes to the point where it, you know back to the Greeks and the Romans as a proportional element that that really helped establish you know how buildings are beautiful and why they're, why they're beautiful. The you know the Greeks and the Romans. It, it, people think that that's too far back, but pretty, pretty much every molding that we use in the house, a chair rail, a baseboard, crown, the cornice, all those, all those moldings come from that Greek and Roman tradition. Now, if you, if you understood that the five orders of architecture are really five proportioning systems, they're really five ways of looking at a building and, and playing with proportions that are based on a human scale, that are based on the male and female body, then you then you look at the base mold. It's not as a necessary piece to cover something else, it, because it isn't what isn't just something. The base mold isn't just something that was just there for a short period of time to cover that screed board. It's all, it's there because there's a relationship between the base and the casing and the plinth block. There's a there's a relationship just like the human body. My hand is proportional to my ear or my foot. Mm-hmm. The same thing is happening when those when those Greeks and Romans designed their buildings. Every piece and part was relational to each other. So you, they looked at the human body as being this perfect, you know, design piece, and so they designed their buildings after that, right? They felt like that represented the universe. So the base only isn't just a, a a quick fix, right, to cover something up. It's the proportional element that speaks to the other pieces and parts. And so the it matters, right? It's, it's just not... You know something that's that, that has a functional element. It, but there's a beauty element too. Right. That's yeah. that's something that's it's hard to teach people is that this stuff matters. And I was listening to actually just this morning I was listening to a podcast um, from a couple of friends of mine who uh, have a show uh, this podcast called Modern Craftsman. And one of the guys on there was was talking about how all the focus now is on teaching people how to build, but nobody is teaching them the why behind it. You know, it's everybody's just so focused on you know get the stuff yeah, done. Yeah, the how to, right? Yeah, and and his argument was we have no shortage of how to information. It's everywhere you turn, you can find good how to information. What you can't find easily 
is how to do it well and you know how to do it architecturally correctly how to do it so it's aesthetically pleasing how to learn about proportions and the proper materials and like you said like what pitch should a windowsill be you know mm -hmm. what's yeah. the difference between a windowsill and a window stool are you calling it the right thing all those right. those things are all kind of slipping nobody's teaching that it's slipping um yeah i couldn't agree more it's uh it, it's but it, here, here's the great thing is that there's i don't know if you guys it, heard of Stephen Muzon. He's kind of with Marion Casado and kind of that school of teaching traditional building elements. He's got a great book on traditional building elements where he actually shows pictures of kind of the wrong way we used to do it and now, now the right way to do it historically. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent book. But he, 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 what his description was, I heard him speak one time, he said basically 1970 <laughs> Uh, 1980 was the like low point in American residential design. That it was just it just couldn't be worse, right? At that point in time, and we've slowly been coming out of that. And part of that low point was was forgetting how to build things. And he says this is industry wide. This is not only just craftsmen. This is builders, architects, homeowners. Um, no one knows. And so we are in a period of rediscovery. But just like in the Renaissance, when those, you know, Palladio and those other guys were, were figuring out how the Roman, Greeks and Romans built, um, we are kind of doing the same thing. We went through a period where modernism took over. The architecture school is no longer training classical design. You know, there's only one architecture school that's focused only on classical design in America, and it's Notre Dame. There, there's like There's like maybe three or four other schools in the country that – that teach traditional design, but it's not exclusive. So realize that there's no architects or designers out there learning this stuff, right? right. There's, there's uh, you know, and so the, the information is gone. And so we do have to, that's why I love Marion Casada's book. It kind of explains where a lot of this stuff comes from. You're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And all of a sudden these details that we've been putting on house for so long start to make sense. And, and you just, by the way, completely gave me an aha moment i i'm just putting together why marion cusado is a professor at notre dame because uh, she is isn't she brian she was she, she, I think was. she just finished up her, her yeah. time there but yeah that, yeah I, that, there you for go a while, yeah <laughs> hey you mentioned um brent you mentioned modern homes and i'm i'm, I'm curious your thoughts on uh you know i know that it's not your so much your thing but um, there's a you know a lot a lot more and more modern homes and and transitionally styled homes being built today being being designed and built today that are just sort of moving away from these traditional forms altogether. So in a way they they're not they're not you know messing up things that were messing up architectural styles and proportions that were established, but they're they're sort of throwing those rules out. And sure. Um, and y y what do you think of of all those all these modern homes? Um, well, I mean I. I I think there's great modern design. I think that there's some of these houses which are just stunning and beautiful. Yeah. I think the majority, okay, uh, 95% are not beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so, look, modernism is a design style, okay? Um, it, is, it is a design style, and, and there's some that are more beautiful than others. The problem with it as a craftsman not as a as, and as an aesthetic, um, but but as a craftsman, is that they're they're easy to build. They're cheap. Mm -hmm. um, there are no moldings. There are no trims. The the elegant aspects of those uh, houses end up being in the materials, um, in the stones that they put in, or the clean lines that are inexpensive. So, I, I mean, one question you almost have to ask is: Are they popular and being built a lot because they're cheap to build? Or because they uh, because it's a popular style. I mean, the, you're 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 in a period where the homeowner is uneducated, and I get a lot of calls from homeowners mm -hmm. calling me up and say, you know, there's something wrong with our house. We're not sure what it is, and it's the parts and the pieces of the traditional home um, that that are just wrong. It, it wouldn't surprise me that if, that people are moving away from traditional design because people don't know how to do it anymore. Right, right, and you see these big mansions that are ugly, and you're like, "Why would I want to build that? What else is out there?" Right, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting point. I never thought about it that way. And and you know, uh, to your point, we we have definitely talked to and and we've published um, projects from some 
some architects um, who who are using uh, modern design and modern style to as a way of cutting costs. Um, you know, I can think of one particular um, design firm in Maine that they really focus on energy performance, and they and that raises the costs of the houses, and so they have to find other ways to bring those costs down. and And one of the things that lets them do that is this sort of very minimal minimalistic styling. Sure. Um, so I think it does work. It does work in that way. You know, you also mentioned education, and I think we should maybe move to that. For, because that's been a passion of yours for a long time and landed you on yeah. TV. Yeah. Can you give us the story of how the hell you ended up on the History Channel? So um, I had kind of chased after TV, uh, I don't know, for five or ten years. I mean, it was you saw what was happening on HGTV. Uh, there was a little bit of frustration, probably just jealousy, that um, some of the things were... <laughs> The, the hosts were on, a, were on those channels that I didn't think knew very much. Yeah. So I had tried um, a number of different things. I tried one with Gary Kaff. I tried some uh, some things that we took to HGTV. Um, it just never went anywhere. Yeah. So I'd kind of given up on it. And see, it was almost two years ago now. I got an email about this time from a production assistant at a just a production company. Um, that said, hey, there's a new show coming out, uh, or there's a, there's a major network, uh, cable network, that's looking to do a show on preservation. Would you be interested? And so I, you know, I, I kind of rolled my eyes because I'd kind of given up on it. But I sent them an email back, said, hey, this is what we do. Yeah, I'm interested. And so a, produ- a producer came over and visited. We had a good talk, and I was telling my wife at the time, I was just like, you know, uh, I'm not expecting anything from this, but then I told her later, you know, actually it was a nice conversation. We had a good time. <laughs> that went into a process of they talked to the History Channel. turned out to be the History Channel. Mm-hmm. The History Channel wanted to do a Skype interview. Um, the production company said, no, we want to do a sizzle reel, which is a two- to three-minute little thing of what the show would be like. Mm-hmm. So they came out here for four or five days they filmed some stuff. I guess it was about three or four days. They filmed some things, and we were walking around and just talking about houses and everything else. And they showed it to the History Channel. The History Channel loved it. So that was probably uh, July. So the History said, well, let's, let's buy a 10-minute uh, uh, pilot. Mm-hmm. So apparently they used to do one-hour pilots that they would air, but this was going to be a non-airing pilot. So, so, so what do they do? They just run it through like a like a panel of people to see if people respond to it. Yeah, I guess they just show it to their executives. I don't know whether they show it to a focus group or not. Yeah. Um, but they they came and shot that. Uh, that was another I think week. Uh, we shot a we shot that demo. That was so that ended up. They showed it to them in October, and and then it went. Uh, they bought it before Christmas of that year. So. As I understand things, that was incredibly fast. Sometimes these deals take, you know, two years of, of production, going back and forth and waiting. So really fast, they bought eight episodes. Um, it we started filming in uh, April, May, June. Yeah, April, May, and June um, of last last year. So two years ago, they called me them in April, May, and June. They, they they were shooting, and then it came out in October. And uh, they showed five of the eight episodes, and then with the with the election and everything else going on, they they kind of stopped. Okay. They um, started showing it in Europe uh, last month, and it was in Australia and Egypt and all these all over the world. And then they're supposed to re-air the show, from what we understand, in uh, the fall. And they'll decide whether they're going to buy a second season or not. So it, it's pretty tough. Wild and crazy ride, but yeah. uh, that I'm, that isn't over yet. But it's, it's been kind of interesting. Well, I sure hope that they that they pick it up and keep it going because I I thought it, I mean I'm a geek like you, so I was just way into it. It was like listening to somebody. I'm sitting there watching it, going, "Yeah, yes, thank you." Somebody else saying this, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm real well, cool. Cur- yeah, appreciate I, you saying that. I mean, I've done a, a lot of video work through through fine home building and and and. I know it can be a real grind. Um, yeah. So I'm curious. You said that they – so they essentially shot – did you say eight or ten episodes worth of stuff? Eight. Okay. And that was over the course of three months? 
Yeah, we didn't finish in three months uh, filming. They they had a uh, called uh, callbacks or post ops or whatever they were, where they, they where they came back for a week at a time to kind of finish things up. The uh, it <laughs> it took a lot longer to do the projects when they were filming than you than I understood. I mean, the learning cliff I went through oh, yeah. uh, in this process was pretty grueling. Um, but great people, the production company, the company called Red Arrow out of Tennessee, just the nicest, greatest people in the world. And so um, we made it through, finally, finally shot everything. But, yeah, I mean, you're talking these projects take three to five times longer Yep. When wow. when cameras are around. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's what is it like a two or three three camera crew or? There's a two camera crew. Okay. And then you uh, with the producers. sound guy and some production assistants and yep. stuff. I mean, they, it's, uh, they're, 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 it's not like you see these movie sets where you know there's trailers and everything else. There's nothing like that. I mean, it's a pretty skeleton crew. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's you know eight people with production assistants and things like that. Yeah, um, and they're just following you around throughout your day, or are they trying to kind of yeah? Craft so we, a story? we map it out about ninety. Oh, so if we had if we had thirty projects that we went through, uh, you know, twenty eight of them were ours. The projects we already had. Okay, and um, when you say pro- when you the, say project, you mean like uh, jobs that you had on the books that your crew was working. Correct. On. Gotcha. And so we and we had more jobs than that, so we laid them out with them and just said, "What are you guys interested in?" Mm-hmm. Um, and so we would talk about what could be done. You learn about, you know, just logistics of how to tell a story on TV and things like that. And so there were some projects that just didn't work. I mean, some of the houses we're building will take two years. And so uh, you have to get grab pieces and parts of those projects to make them work. Right. Um, but, yeah, so it, it, it took a little bit longer to do those some of those things. It was um, it was hard, but, but there was great people there, and so we, we it, was, it was fun. So, so you ended up. I mean, did, is your first time seeing it when they put it on TV, or do they do they go through edit process with you? And no, they didn't let me see it. <laughs> um, so it was a little bit. Uh, there's some anxious moments. Sure, it's like, hey, um, hey, everybody, my show premieres in October. Let's all sit around and watch it. I have no idea what it's going to be like. Pretty much. <laughs> So were you yeah. happy with it? Were, uh, were you surprised? Did they try and sneak some drama in there? You know, I'm. Uh, they, I was very thankful that these guys did not. They uh, they were pretty um, sensitive to just the privacy things or whatever else we didn't want to get shown. Mm-hmm. And so they were. There was no. And, and when I when I first said this, I wanted I'd do this show. I said, look. This has got to be about building and construction and design and stuff. It can't be about drama. And they said, well, because it's on history, they're not really interested in drama either. Yeah, you're lucky. There's, there's, in that column episode, the first one, uh, that homeowner, that lady, she started crying. <laughs> um, and I was surprised that they didn't show that. And and they're like, no, no, this is a history channel. We don't show that. In fact, we you know cut that stuff out. So. Nice. Yeah, they were, they were laughing because, you know, they're like, if this is HGTV, there have been five minutes about her crying right. while she was crying. Right. So, you know, so I was lucky that way, right, that there wasn't that drama. Um, but there, it, it was good people. I, I actually had a good experience with, you know, just the, the people in the process and everything else. It's just, it just took too long. It was, it was grueling. I mean, you're adding a 40-hour day to your day. To, I mean, 40-hour week to your week. Yeah. And so, I mean, I was working on Saturdays and Sundays trying to keep catch up with things. It was a grueling three months. It was a lot of work. Yeah, people, people. Uh, I've been in talks on on a couple of different TV show kind of things, and and people look at me like you're crazy. Why would you not go take this? And I'm just like you. Do, you don't understand what it is until you've you done. Don't it. understand. It I'm, is. It is. I'm telling it you, is not you're exactly right. It's not what you think it is. <laughs> and you know the other thing. I mean, just to the guys listening out there that might want to try to show it. It didn't lead to this bonanza of work that was just, you know, oh my gosh, you know, we, there there was a there was a little bubble and a little burst. Our our, our uh, website, you know, had a lot more traffic. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the typical job that we do, either building the house or doing some restoration stuff, it ended up being a lot of small things that came in. It mm-hmm. wasn't. It isn't just like 
if you get a show, and this is what I thought, you know, five or ten years ago, if you get a show, it just solves everything. It, do, it really doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, your bread and butter is still coming from the actual work you're already I'm doing. I'm telling you. Yeah. But it is a, it's a fun way to, to pass on that information and, and you know. Well, no doubt. And that's, and that's why I hope it continues is because it is a, a, the, the encouraging thing to me was the people coming up and saying, hey, I like your show. It's entertaining, but I'm also learning something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm all about education. So if, if that's a good means to do that, I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, man. Listen, I was watching some of the episodes, watching your, your crew, you know, talking about hand tools and and working all these different crazy windows and glue ups and i'm like i'm ready to quit this job and go work for brent <laughs> come <laughs> except on it, except it's so damn hot out in texas i don't know how I can handle it <laughs> yeah don't come in august yeah man they were right to not shoot the shoot the series then so when do you when do you when do you find out if you're going to be going going again for another round well i think they they said they're 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 I think they're going to show it again in October and they're going to redo the whole series at that time. And I imagine it'd be a couple months after that where we'll know if they're serious. I mean, hist- history has uh, it doesn't have a great fit there. Um, even though the show's about history and everything else, the building show is very different from like American Pickers or Pawn Stars. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, they did they just have to see if it's going to fit in the, for their client and so that's really the deal that um so we'll, we'll see what happens yeah i mean i i, I from from my perspective and the the work that i've done um it's very clear that you're an excellent host on camera you're you're fun but you're very informative um and they're they're doing a really great job shooting you they're really they're really putting together a a well-produced show i mean it's just it's really easy to watch it's really it's really they're they're doing you've you've got a nice crew working for you and like they clearly well, I appreciate have a that right the uh I, I i would i would give the credit to red arrow for that they're the good people they're smart people they've got good experience and so um but yeah thanks for saying that i appreciate that is that is that something that 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 production company specializes in uh you know yeah home, in home fact they do shows? a lot of work for hgtv and okay. so um they they actually know that home show kind of you know uh process right it's really what you're showing uh and trying to t- take people through this 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 uh you know how things get put together and so they're, they're pretty good at it and and for people um who who missed it on the history channel where can people go to watch these episodes now so there's the the history channel app if you have that you can you can watch it on the app um that's a good question I, I think if you if you have cable, you can watch it on the History Channel site. I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, I know that they they were showing it on FYI because A and E owns History, and they would talk. They were talking about showing it like it's on A and E in Australia, and so they it, and it was shown on FYI uh, quite a bit, and so. I think there's going to be a number of different avenues to get it uh, when it comes back out in the fall. But, oh. uh, uh, to get it right now on demand, I think you have to do the, the History Channel app. I'm checking out their website right now, the History Channel, and it does look like you can watch them there, but I think you have to plug in your, your uh, cable, right. cable yeah, provider. Right, exactly. You can watch them on the History Channel online. Right, um, right. Yeah. Cool. Well, people should go check that out for sure. And, Brent, give us the names of some of these books that you've written because uh, – I want to. I want to point people. I, I. I did buy that. Um, uh, the Muzin book that you mentioned. Uh, I. Okay. Good. I, I saw you recommended it the other day, and when I was yeah. when I was looking up some info on you, and I clicked right through to Amazon, bought it right that minute. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good. It's a really uh, good tool, right? Um, I, I wrote my first book was a book on historic millwork uh, between from 1870 to 1940. Uh, when I first got back to Texas. I was asking a guy in an architectural salvage shop, I was, I, was, I was wondering to myself, you know, in 1920, what would have Carpenter, how would have Carpenter have ordered these doors? Because I knew they came from manufacturing companies, but I didn't know how they ended up in the houses. And he goes, oh, well, they would have ordered from this. And he handed me this hard, hard-covered, this beautifully binded book called the Universal Design Cat, like Dover now reprints it, but, uh, and it's available on that, on that online site. But... It was just these beautiful renderings of doors and windows and all the things that would have been available. So I started collecting those books. I have over 300 now uh, from 1870 to the 1950s and 60s. And so the first book is really Architectural Millwork, 
kind of in a post-industrial age. Um, my second book was called Traditional American Rooms. If you guys don't know about Winter Tour, which is the DuPont family home in Delaware, mm-hmm. it should be a trip that you should take. Basically, Henry DuPont in the 1920s fell in love with American yeah, Americanism, uh, basically rooms and uh, art, uh, artifacts and antiques and everything else. And he began this collection that is the finest collection of American antiques and details in America, in the world. It, uh, it, so basically he started buying rooms from houses. And he'd buy, mm. he, like he would find out about a house in Philadelphia from 1760 that's being torn down. He bought the parlor from it and installed it in his house. There's he do this all over the country. All 13 colonies are represented. Uh, he's got rooms from you know 1680 to 1860, right up into that post-industrial uh, era. And he is uh, there's 175 rooms at Winter Tour. So we we collected or went and studied about 40 of those rooms, federal and Georgian rooms, to really understand the proportion and scale and detail of the different moldings. And so how they work. And that was really where I learned about classicism and how all that stuff came together. My mentor in that thing was, was the lady who teaches at Denver, um, University of Denver, in a traditional program, um, Christine Frank. And she, she kind of walked me through kind of, I was like, why does the freeze look like that here and look like this there? And what's this architrave? And that's the craziest detail. And so I just learned so much about how America was built. Um, during that time period, from really rustic, you know, you know, New Hampshire, you know, taverns to really fine Philadelphia homes, and then the last book was uh, um, building the Thomas House in an instant age, and it's really this thing of like, you know, what I learned from North Bennett Street, you know, why houses aren't built like they are, like they used to be, what the problem is. I, I wrote it. I, I wrote those other two books really for for professionals and for architects and designers. I wrote this book really for homeowners and builders to understand kind of kind of what was going on, educate the homeowner on, uh, you know, how things should be built and, and why things are ugly today. I was going to title the book uh, Why We Build Ugly Houses, um, <laughs> but the, 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 the publisher wouldn't let me. <laughs> what do you think? Are you, you, got, you got more books in you? Are you going to have another one? Yeah, I'd like to write a book on... Um, uh, kind of a, 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 a how to be a master builder and the, mm-hmm. that book is kind of the the idea of you know, what, what would a master builder have known and I know when I was when I got back from North Bennett Street I was I was doing trim carpentry right so that, that was really my skill in the building trade and, and as I began to get older in my business and begin to hire trim carpenters I realized there's a lot of skilled guys out there that didn't have a measuring stick of, of, you know, how good am I? You know, what, what else can I learn? What else can I do? And so th- this Master Builder book would be, you know, how to be a master builder in a world of knuckleheads, um, <laughs> how, to, how to pursue the craft, how to uh, really be good at it. What are the skill sets that I need to know, that I need to understand to call myself a master? It was one of the first questions I asked when I was at North Bennett Street. I asked my instructor, I said, hey, you know, I heard you hear the stories of a hundred years ago that uh, the craftsman would show up and you could look at his toolbox and see what kind of craftsman he was by his joinery and his details and stuff. I go, you know, we're in an era where people carry their tools in five gallon buckets. You know, how do you how do you tell what a what a good craftsman is? And his comment to me, which was interesting at the time, he said he said, you know, you really check the tools and see if their chisels their mm-hmm. chisels are sharp. Yeah, and um. I thought that was really good because I think that one of the skills that I think a lot of carpenters don't know is how to sharpen their tools. Yeah. And so you think about the guys in the, you know, even as early as, or as late as the 1970s were having to hand sharpen their, their, their hand saws. And so uh, all these skills that we used to understand and used to know, kind of how to be a master builder today. And what were those? What are those skills? That would be the, the next thing I'm trying to put together. And you know what? It, it starts in in very subtle ways too. Like I'm a big believer in you don't you don't use the nail gun until you know how to use a hammer really well. You know you gotta. I couldn't agree more. You gotta you gotta learn to crawl before you walk and walk before you run, kind of thing. You know, learn all the rules before you break them is kind of my. Well, and that was the great thing about North Bend Street. I mean, the first thing we learned to do there was take an old hand plane and get it sharp again and get it to work again. I mean, when you kind of go back to the basics, and and you're right, a, a hammer is a 
excellent tool that people, you know, think of it just as a kind of a bully club. But, you know, the, the fact is, is that it's a, uh, it is a skill. I remember that the, I had a mentor, the, one of the first guys I hired, he was an older guy, um, but he was showing me how he, had, he would hand drive nails. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you, it was a thing of beauty. I mean, the, the way he flipped the nails around, and I mean, he would have a handful of nails in one hand, and the way he would flip it around and be able to pop, bang, pop, bang, and just be able to, you know, quick and fast and yeah. effective and, you know, not bruising the wood. I mean, it was, it, there's, there's a skill there and people kind of ignore that in an era where you've got, you got good hand tools. You know, One of the interesting things I write in my book is that the irony about hand tools, and I love tools, right? You know, nothing better than going tool shopping <laughs> is that tools improve so much that they actually make our craftsmanship worse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. That, that we we end up becoming so reliant on nail guns and things like that, we forget how to use a hammer, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I tell the example in the book of the the you know the builder gets a call back, trim carpenter gets a call back. Hey, there's some moldings loose in my house. He drives over there, he unloads the nail gun, he unloads the hoses, he, he pulls everything in, he goes into the house, pop pop, you know, puts it back on and walks out. You know, an hour later. You take a nail and a hammer, and you're done in five minutes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. I had a – you just made me think of, of a time. I, I was working for a landscape construction company, and the owner, who was a real master at, at, at all of these trades involved in what we did, and he one day he decided he was going to show me how to use a steel rake. And I was young. I was like you know, maybe 20 years old, and I – I wanted to hit him with the rake I had in my hand. I mean, he told me he was going to show me how to use a steel rake. Yeah. And sure, and, and he did, and yep. I, 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 I bit my tongue, and I, I listened to him, and I went back to doing it the way I was doing it. And then when he wasn't looking, I, I started trying to use it the way he taught me to use it. <laughs> and sure as shit, there yeah. was a way to use a steel rake. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about that a lot. I mean, there's, it's even the guys that have been working on our magazine for decades, we still have meetings. We had one last week where it was like, well, what basic topics do we want to cover? What if we did something like, you know, laying out a wall for framing and it's and everybody's reaction is always the same every time it's oh, what are we getting there's not enough to talk about there and i go and then as we start talking it's like whoa we're, we're gonna need we're gonna need six pages for this you know right, <laughs> it's, there's right, always yeah, there's exactly. something you could do a master class on how to use a hammer if you mm-hmm. if you cultivate that curiosity and you really want to learn the right way to use your tools you will well you this, can find this, as much this, as you want and it, and that this book is something that I would love to be collaborative, right? What I mean, because I'm I I know something, but I don't know everything. And, right. And this is the kind of thing that you could you could get, uh, you know, open it up kind of as a, a web tool and just and just have people contributing from all over the world, even uh, talking about what are the traits and what are the what are the basic skills. I think it'd be great if if a, if a trim carpenter, a framer, uh, you know, stair builder had accreditation, you know, basically I, you know, I got a type C or type B or type A kind of, kind of education and training. I know how to do these things. Yeah. It would help builders to know that what they're hiring. It would help trim carpenters know how to charge for a job. I mean, it's, yeah, the, the barrier. it's something that used to be available, you know, when you had the building, building guild, uh, builder guilds early in America, I've got one of their price books from Washington, DC from the 1820s talks about how much you charge for different stuff and so there's a lot of guys giving their work away um and they shouldn't they shouldn't have to do that i I, the only thing that separated me from every other con well there was nothing that separated me from every other contractor when i started i paid my 220 bucks to the state of connecticut and i had my home improvement contractor's license and i was ready to i was ready to work in people's houses right along somebody who's been doing it for 35 years it didn't matter we were equal in the in the eyes of the consumer, mm-hmm. which is just ridiculous, yeah. and I and I I, I, I get frustrated with that uh, at the NAHB for you know the National Home Builders Association for having that Master Builder Program accreditation. Oh yeah, because it's a it's a misnomer in my name, my yeah. mind. It's Don't, just you're, you're a, not a master builder. You learn how to manage your business, but you're not a master builder. We get a lot of we get some people in you know that 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 have companies doing this or that, and they, they refer to themselves as a master bil- master carpenter, and I'm just like. Mm. Did you? You're not a master carpenter, but I mean, I, I get it. You're good. Not but that much. Yeah, <laughs> that's a little much, dude. Yeah. Um, well, listen, it was a pleasure talking to you, Brent. Um, Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Yeah, we, we, Brian, and I meant to ask you if you ever, with 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 your name, if you ever get 
confused with uh, Brett Hall, I'm sure, all the time, right? All the time. When he was playing here in Dallas um, for the Stars, I I could call a restaurant and go, this is Brent Hall, and I would get a table. (laughs) (laughs) I believe it. I believe it. Those days are gone. But, yeah, no, I get it all the time. My parents are Canadian, and so uh, we go up to Canada every, you know, once a summer most times, and uh, I'll cross the border, and the, the guards will do a double tag. And they're like, wait, who's this way? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I get it all the time. It's, 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 I wish I was Brett Hull. That's, that's what I wish. No way. <laughs> Brett Hull wishes he was you. <laughs> um, anyway, it was a pleasure to have you on. I hope you, I, I hope you get picked up for that second season. I hope you'll come back on the show sometime and talk to us about more I'd stuff. I'd love to. And, yeah, um, I love talking about this stuff. You know, I'm passionate about it. It so. goes goes without saying that we would we would be thrilled to have you do something with the magazine too. So we will definitely be getting in touch with you. Uh, yeah, please. To yeah, work no, out some I, stuff. Brian, give me a call or whatever. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I love what you guys do. I mean, you guys are about the trades and crafts and everything else. I've been a fan of your magazine for ever. Great. Well, we appreciate the support. And um, listen, uh, we're going to go to findhomebuilding.com slash podcast. We're going to be able to find links for. All of the things that Brent just talked about, his books, um, the, the, the manual on the APT website, um, links to where you can watch his show, all sorts of stuff. So check that out, findhomebuilding.com slash podcast. And uh, Brent, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, guys. And uh, enjoy your, your restoration. I hope it's not too hot there yet. Yeah, it's not too bad. <laughs> y'all, y'all take care. Appreciate you guys. All right. Take See care. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. That's going to be a wrap for this week. Next week, we're going to be having another Texan on the show, Brian. Yes. Jeremy Martin of Reesher Martin Fine Homes, who will be educating us on just how the heck he's managing to do fixed price remodeling. If you listen to a couple shows back, we we mentioned that briefly. Um, Well, he heard us talking about it, and he got in touch and said, I'd be happy to come on the show and tell you all about it. So we're going to have him on. I'm looking forward to having him on. Not only only is that... um, really interesting that they do this this fixed price building but they're just a an awesome builder i yeah. got to visit one of their projects and pro- i get to visit what i think is one of the most challenging remodels i've ever seen um and they just and within one percent of budget is of what the budget they're, that's what they shoot typical. for typical yes that's insane yes it's insane yeah so well, uh, jeremy's gonna have a jeremy will have some good stuff for us super cool to talk to brent yeah man you, people out there, if you haven't checked out his show, I mean, it's really cool. It's, you know, it's uh, when I had first heard, I remember somebody coming into the office being like, oh, did you see that new that new show on, on TV, Lone Star Restoration with, with uh, Brent Hall? And I'm like, the hockey player? Yeah. And it was like. <laughs> and thank you, but by the way, for your slide. No, your yeah. halls. That was dynamite. Yeah. Let's put that on the website. Yeah. I we had, had a little slide <laughs> on the TV behind me with a, a picture of Brent Hall compared to Brett Hall. We'll find out what. No, your uh, halls. Yeah. We'll find out what the crossover is between our audience and hockey fans. Did you? Because <laughs> some will just won't get it at all and other people will think it's great. Did you like how I made one of them look like a, look like a hockey card like the other one? Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. Uh, if you haven't seen Brent's show, Brent show, uh, make sure to go check it out. It's it's very cool. Like they, I, I I mentioned it when we were on the air before when talking to him, but they just did a really nice job capturing him. It's not dramatic. Yeah. It's not over the top. It's it's very easy to watch. Yeah. Um, and and I'm I'm already learning stuff just from the little bit that I've seen, which is awesome. So cool. He's helping to keep craft alive, which is what we love. So anyway, don't forget to shoot us a note at fhbpodcast at taunton.com. Let us know what you think of Brent, uh, any questions that you want us to ask him in the future, um, or any other guests that you'd like us to talk to. Also, keep those questions coming. We're going to do question shows, too. And make sure to hop onto iTunes and help us out with uh, rating and review, and tell friends that you think would enjoy the show. Until next time, this is Justin for Brian and Jeff Behind the Dials saying happy building.